So um, <clears throat> in preparation for this evening, I spoke with each of the artists, and we sort of have gone over the myriad of very regular questions they've been asked over the years about the Harry Who. And in coming to see the exhibition today, I have to say, I think the Art Institute and its curators have done a phenomenal job in making very clear the history of the Harry Who and the collaboration between these artists. And so I really encourage you to uh, not only see the exhibition, but look at the beautiful publication that accompanies it. Um, many of your general questions about how they came to know each other and um, work together on the, on the exhibition and the works you see um, are answered there. Um, most of the panelists have been on other panels here in Chicago, so the challenge for this evening was to find an approach that would really uh, give them the opportunity to talk about things in their past that maybe they haven't reviewed or have, haven't answered in interviews before. Um, but before I get started on that, I really, I, again, I'm grateful to the Art Institute for doing the exhibition. I'm a curator who has passed through Chicago over the last 30 years and had the opportunity and privilege to occasionally see work by artists of the Harry Who. And it really, um, I was floored today to see this, the, the summation of their early work together. Um, what really impressed me, however, about the exhibition is the fact that um, there was a really strong camaraderie um, and exchange of ideas, that they were a group of young artists uh, working at the same time. Again, I'm, I'm happy to hear people saying that they don't have a, a same aesthetic, but their um, energy and feistiness and wit um, and material um, innovations um, and imagination fueled each other at this early time in their life together, and I think the exhibitions just sing with that. They not only were t asking you know, pretty bold questions about um, disciplines of art making, um, I think they obviously had great students, uh, great teachers here at the Art Institute, um, but that in fact uh, they really sort of uh, were assessing what representational art could be at a time of political and social uncertainty um, in the world, and um, that led them to be provocative, not only in terms of what constituted a painting, literally, the materials that they were using, but also in terms of compositional strategies and, and materials. Um, <clears throat> last year, there was a Scholars' Day here at the Art Institute in preparation for um, the exhibition, and I was privileged to be able to come to that. And what was really winning was how much fun they still are having together. Um, so it's a, a series of friendships and relationships that really are um, about respect and strong and feisty opinions and individuality, um, but they still are um, perpetually, I think, um, uh, I guess, inspired by one another, which is really um, lovely. And as an art historian, um, I've written on other um, early modernist groups of artists who actually forged their own way in the world. And I think they make a great uh, model in a, in a very sort of uh, commodity-driven art world um, that artists really don't need to wait around for dealers or museums or curators to um, give them uh, traction in the world. They can actually create their own world, and they can create their own identity and opportunity. And um, some of the greatest moments in art history have been when artists have bonded together to do that, to make a presentation, to take control of, um, of what they are thinking is interesting in art making at, at the time. Um, <clears throat> Some of the misnomers, I think, about their work is that they were pop artists. But I really, as you go through the exhibition, and I think it's very well presented in the ephemera cases, as well as in some of the exhibition design uh, decisions, that they are very inspired by vernacular culture and the, the world around them. And that included you know, common advertisements, materials, um, I can't remember, I think it was Jim that said, going to flea markets um, and sales here in um, empty lots in Chicago, they found great inspirational material. Um, but they really um, also had a lot of fun. And I think one of the wonderful things about the exhibition being here at the Art Institute is that all of these artists would attest to the fact that this institution was very formative in their um, recognition of themselves as artists and their um, 
the challenge that the collection here, as well as the teaching programs that took place here, um, provided them as young artists. And um, just as we were in the back waiting, a, a number of them were in this room when they were not even teenagers doing Saturday art classes. And that, um, and, and or as art students that they were listening to their professors, whether it was Whitney Halstead or um, Kathleen Blackshear, um, they, the world of art was, was open and vast and possible, and they could see themselves uh, contributing to that conversation. And I think that the collection laid down a gauntlet of how um, aspirational that could be for them as individuals. So um, I want to give them a chance to sort of talk about um, some of the ways that they cross-pollinated early on. I think that's my first question. So in the exhibition, I see a real um, kind of uh, expansion in terms of you, you started out, you did your first exhibition, and then you just really started to like jazz each other up. And um, I love this image because it really shows that they not only um, were, were aspiring in their art, but they were having a good time making it. And actually in the video in one of the galleries, it talked about like how fun these openings were for these exhibitions. But the fact that, that art could be that, um, I want to, to move to them talking about it. Quickly, I'm just gonna show you representations of each of their artwork, because I think to refresh your memory um, from being in the exhibitions earlier today uh, would be a good idea. Um, one of the things that's amazing about these images is that um, how um, expansive their, their, their notion of representation was. I mean, you, um, we're gonna look in a little bit about at works from the Art Institute collection. I asked each of them to give me one or two artworks that they felt were formative when they were a young artist um, coming here. Um, they all, one of the things that I think is really like a terrible myth is that um, in a sense that they were only inspired by what was going on in the present day world. They are all very astute uh, students of art history and they often are here at the Art Institute looking at the collection. They've all, many of them have taught here. Um, but that their uh, interest in the collection has sustained over all these years and that they find renewed inspiration from the traditions in art um, as well as what was new in the world. So I guess my first question to all of you is, I see that as you, you really collaborated in terms of conceiving of the exhibitions and on the work, and as you move through, it's fantastic to see the sequence of exhibitions upstairs, that things that you learned in terms of uh, vocabulary or techniques of making your work, you just really kept ramping it up all the way through. And you didn't necessarily stick with one innovation, a certain material, but that you were, um, in fact, um, bar I would say it was barring, but it's clear that there was an open discussion between you as you were making your work and exhibiting it. And I wondered if you could fill us all in a little bit on how that started out and what you knew. I know you knew each other as students, not all of you did, but that um, some of you were in class together. But um, were there, in fact, stated goals when you sat down for that first Harry Who meeting? besides getting your work shown somewhere? <laughs> we, we, uh, sometimes people call us a collective. Uh, we're not, we were not a collective. We didn't sit down and write a manifesto or decide what was acceptable to have in the show or what was not acceptable. We admired each other's work, but uh, we, we didn't want to be uh, identified as a, as a group in that way. As I said one time, uh, the only part of collective that we would probably agree with, we want to be collected. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that I do think, um, I feel like the aesthetic of the Harry Who, and I had said this to Gladys on the phone, is come over here and I'm going to intimidate you and make you uncomfortable. Um, and that um, in different ways, I think, um, in terms of how the works are made, each artist is very distinct. But there's a lot of um, compression in some of the works. There's confrontational imagery in others. There's um, irresolved compositional elements or presentations of figures. There's a lot of information in some of the artist's work um, 
not necessarily uh, tied together and resolved. And I think that that all, again, was part of this reconceiving of what representation could be. But what did you all think? Was that, did any of that come out of your studies at the Yard Institute, or really it was just individual endeavor? Well, for me, when, well, first walking into this room in art history, I sat way up in the second or last row up there on that side. Um, I think it was just simply absorbing everything that I saw up on the screen and then walking through the museum, that everything just became a part of, of what came out. And I, uh, I've always had uh, the admiration for some of those single portraits, you know, the, a Whistler, Munch's industrial paintings, uh, the, the man, you know, standing there. And I suffer from the horror of the vacuum. So I would start out with a big figure and then keep adding more because, and I think maybe the um, installations kind of grew that way, that more is more is more is more, and you just keep adding until you can't do any more. Could, could you have people say their name? Yes, thank you, yes. So there were, I th we, we thought before we came out here that there were actually slides shown with everyone's name. So, okay, very good. Well, I'm, I'm not that important. Jennifer Gross. Gladys. Oh, Gladys Nelson. And I'm Art Green. <laughs> Jim Nunn. Sue Ellen Roca. Jim Falconer. So, yes, uh, sorry, we thought that the slides had been shown with all of their images on them. <laughs> okay, that didn't happen. We, we thought it must be self-explanatory. You're not going to confuse me with Jim Falconer and uh, there's <laughs> Sue Ellen Rocca sitting next to Art Green here and uh, <laughs> Gladys Nelson is way down on the end somewhere. Sorry, I'm irreverent. <laughs> Carl Worsham is the not here, but his spirit is certainly here. And spirit he is, they're screaming Jay. Yes. yes, thank you. Yeah. You, you know, one of the things I'd like to bring up when you start to say about the, uh, the beginning of the uh, Harry Who, everything was put together for, or at least the ball started rolling, put together for Don Baum's uh, space. The, the, if you want to call it the performance space, you can call it the performance space, but the gallery. So Don, having that kind of um, coherence of thought and years, I don't know how many years, but years of having that space being a target for Chicago artists really drew, I think, all of our attentions to put it together in a multi-person a multi show. And the multi-person show was a group of people who were friends because of the context of the age where we're students together and we share uh, the same kind of energies and anxieties and uh, tensions, but Don gave it the format. Am I safe in saying that? And I think it's really important to, to make it, and in some ways, that's really what Chicago, uh, that's, what, that's what sort of makes it Chicago in a certain way, is Chicago gave it the place to show, and Don's responsible for it. And he has been responsible for a long time. Yeah. Chicago has a great history of not-for-profit spaces and, and exhibition venues for contemporary and younger artists. And so that continued. I think it started um, around that time and continued right through the 70s and 80s. Um, and then some of those uh, spaces came to New York but that, in fact, these opportunities for artists to, to talk about art, to look at art together, to really feel that their art was important was a legacy here that I think made many artists stay. And um, there have been, we were, we were discussing uh, all the groups that really weren't groups um, uh, during, during the week. 
and um, how really it was just artists having an opportunity to exhibit anywhere. And so there were rubrics that were created, but people were doing very indivi individual work. And you all are uh, you know, exemplary of that. Everyone here didn't necessarily stay in Chicago. Some of people went to teach. Some of you came back. Some of you had not come back. But that it was a springboard for you after art school to really you know, understand that being an artist was, in fact, um, a viable and um, important practice. And uh, it didn't seem that viable when we graduated. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, financially, uh, or just in terms of uh, exhibition. Well, most people want a viable life in the arts. Moved to New York or mm, San Francisco okay. or Europe or somewhere else, L.A. Uh, there really was not, you know, it was a different world, you know, and uh, there were very very few galleries that showed Chicago arts to begin with, mm -hmm. and especially young artists. Uh, but there were groups, as you said, uh, they're packed, participating artists of Chicago. Ellen Lanyon was instrumental in forming that, and I think there were about 100 or more people in it. And uh, I got to know a lot of people through some of the first shows down in Mies van der Rohe's Herman Hall in mm -hmm. IIT. And it was just an extremely wide variety of uh, of artists. I remember one of the first past shows featured a uh, privy and a, a, a porta potty in the middle. It was not for fun, it was functional, but it was a piece that somebody had done mm -hmm. where the audience could contribute to the art. And <laughs> so there was a wide range of people. And I got to know people through that and then through the Hyde Park Art Center where a lot of people taught and uh, through Don Baum's programs where he had. Uh, very uh, democratic things where anyone could uh, apply for a show and if you got in, you, you met all these other people, it was great. Yeah. Do you think that there were so many artists in Chicago because of the Art Institute or they were coming from other programs like Cranbrook or just Chicago seemed like a great? I think most of the artists came out of the school, Okay. out of the School of the Art Institute. Mm -hmm. um, the generation that are uh, the, known as the monster roster, mm -hmm. you know, that emerged post World War II in the fifties. Um, I think the I think the majority uh, the majority of artists, or almost all the artists um, that were in Chicago, uh, came through the School of the Art Institute, and of course, that is part of the museum. Right. So I think those two institutions are very, very critical, very important in terms of understanding the history of, of art in Chicago. Yes. So, you know, we didn't, didn't have the big gallery system that mm -hmm. existed in New York. Um, and I think people who stayed here stayed because there were things here that they really liked, you know. Yeah. Uh, those that left, and many did, I think we're, we're going after the more commercial galleries and the kind of uh, opportunities that existed in New York, maybe that didn't exist in Chicago, but it, it wasn't, you know, there, it was the whole atmosphere, I think, of Chicago and, uh, you know, the things that we saw here and the things, um, you know, like Maxwell Street and, you know, I, and the music and, you know, so um, I think Chicago was, for those that stayed, very much the milieu that, that they wanted to, to work in. Affordable studio space, perhaps. What's that? Affordable studio space, that might be. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I always <laughs> work from my home. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of, I, I was going to say, one of the things I'd also like to mention, as well as having your world-class museum to filter through, that the collectors in Chicago were very generous in sharing their collections with young people. And that was quite amazing to walk into someone's home and see the Magritte over the fireplace or something like that. And that was a very, very common place that there would be gatherings that that one would be invited to after certain openings and so on, where you got to see what was going on after the walls had, uh, you know, life, life after a show. 
And there it is in somebody's apartment. So in the legacy of that, so there were truly some wonderful modern art collectors here in Chicago in the early 20th century. And so do you feel as though that just perpetuated that layer of great art coming here? Um, more than, say, galleries were an influence in that. that I they're... think it all works hand in hand. I mean, you, you can't have one without having the other, without having something else come in. I mean, when I was going to art school and <clears throat> became aware of all these things going on, and then shortly after graduating, it's like, what, what makes Chicago so, you know, viable and so exciting and so on. And I would joke with myself and say, well, when I was a little girl and we stepped out, uh, I lived on the north side, and when the wind was blowing, you could smell the stockyards. That surely must be what makes Chicago a, a you know, <laughs> or the baby Ruth, the, or the Reed's root beer factory. So you had the Ola factory things going on too. But there's, uh, there's a lot to be said for having an art school attached to a museum because you can't and and Jim and I lived out on the west coast and there was a lot going on out there but there wasn't very much in terms of like going to see collections and it makes a big difference to stand in front of something and something glom of from it something yeah. of substance yeah. so we, we literally we literally walk through the museum to get to our classes in the school and I think that's a very important part of the experience. And I do remember, and I, I'm not sure 100% that I'm correct on this, but I seem to remember at a certain point in my studies here at the School of the Art Institute that there were some restrictions put on carrying a portfolio through the museum. And the, I believe there were pretty fervent uh, student protests about that. But, but literally, I mean, I re, you know, remember coming in Michigan Avenue and walking to the back of the museum to go to class, and then being in the galleries all the time. Um, and some of the classrooms were actually about the galleries, uh, a few of them. So that those two things, I think, are, are very closely linked, the museum and the, and the school and the experience of, of being able to see, see the wonderful collection at the museum. So, um, so why don't we look at a couple of the images that you all uh, said were of interest to you. And some of you chose the same one, so you can just jump in. But just so you know how avid they are, literally in the back while we were waiting to come in, uh, Jim was like flashing a new Kirchner that's up in one of the galleries to everybody. And we were all ooing and eyeing. So keeping track literally on a regular basis of what's going up in the galleries at the Art Institute is... Uh, fair game. So um, the, they've all can see it down here, and um, and I didn't keep track of who was particularly interested in this painting. But um, one of the things that I did note in uh, the choices that you all made was uh, works that were very imaginative, and works that often had a strong sense of drawing in them. And I, um, you know, if I was going to say that there were some. <laughs> generalizing rubrics that you shared and interested in. These are things that interest, I think, you. Yeah. I'd be interested in knowing who chose that. I did. Oh, you did? Did art? you choose it, too? No. Oh. It, <clears throat> when I you came like to the Art chose. Institute, I came from uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, and uh, my dad was an engineer, and my mom made quilts, uh, but uh, I was supposed to be an engineer of some sort, a mechanical or, or civil, and uh, I was on my way to engineering school when I applied to Indiana. I got a letter back saying, we're having rush week, bring your tennis whites. And that was the end of Indiana for me. I, <laughs> I, didn't, wanna, I didn't have any tennis whites. And I worked for a year and got persuaded by an art teacher I had to apply to the Art Institute. And I really, although I had a few drawing classes at the local art museum, knew nothing about art. I couldn't tell my Monet from my Renoir, and I hadn't a clue. And I was coming here to be a graphic designer, industrial designer, so I started on that. But the great thing about the Art Institute is that in the first year, in those days, you all took the same short courses in drawing, painting, ceramics, whatever, photography. And by the end of the year, I decided I wanted to be a, an artist, a painter. and. Uh, my f favorite artist in my first year was Bernard Buffet, the artist who had this sort of tricky line that he developed. 
And my second year, I got swept up by uh, this Peter Bloom painting called The Rock. And I love the uh, catastrophe of it. I tend to in enjoy thinking about catastrophes. And uh, also just the, the scale of it and the ambition of it. I've gone on from there, but that's what hit me in my second year. When I saw it in the gallery, it really um, made, it made me, I, and I can't remember who the artist is who said it, that they, as a young student, saw that they could, if they became a painter, make any world that they wanted to. And I think that that painting gives evidence to that. I, that, that structure in the middle, or the rock, it's, I guess that's the rock. I can see a relationship be, between that and, a, because a lot of your drawings and paintings have a structure, which you talked about, uh, yeah. I've I, heard you talk about in terms of it ha relating to bridges. I, and, I was a very, I feel like I was, the, in, in the picture where we're all jumping, I'm jumping straight up and down. Everyone else is jumping and, uh, kind of contortions, and I felt like, you know, the straight guy in the bunch, but uh, uh, but uh, my paintings, I always wanted things to be supported, and these people would have, you know, a face floating in the, on the canvas, nothing <laughs> holding it up, and I always had to have, you know, trestles and things holding things up. <laughs> You incorporated a lot of architecture into your work. And I thought that that was very interesting in both yeah, the graphics and I, 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 And my third year, I got persuaded myself that I should be an architect or a filmmaker. Thank heavens I didn't, but anyway. <laughs> okay, next one. So I can't remember who picked this one. Uh, um, I picked it. I can't really tell you why, but <laughs> uh, I've always liked this painting. It, it doesn't relate to what I what I do really, and what I well, I think it was maybe about recent. Maybe it's twenty years ago. I discovered a museum studies uh, publication from the from the museum that coupled this painting with three others which were a series of very large, a very large commission to a, from a Russian, um, pre-revolutionary Russian collector. And it's, it, I found it kind of fascinating seeing this as an isolated thing and, an, and also that it fit into a, a series of four. The other thing, the other thing that I've always found Plus, plus in this article there was stages to the painting, you know, which were uh, developed in an earlier stage, later mid, you know, and then final stage. Uh, and you can you can see if you really you can't I can't really tell too much here. You can't see the stroking, but the, the stroking has a level of canceling out and and adding forms canceling out and adding forms again, so you kind of feel uh, like a development to the painting. The painting still exists as, as the figure, but you can feel the artist shifting things to create a certain type of um, sometimes minute, sometimes really kind of almost catastrophe sort of changes so that it has a multi multiplicity of uh, energies in it. The other thing, of course, is the snake that comes up from the bottom. I'm assuming it's a snake. But uh, so it's, it has both a general purpose uh, figure in the landscape, and the landscape has a comment on the figure. Does that make sense? Yes, it is. I, and actually, I went through the armor uh, galleries where this is hanging, St. George and the Dragon. And it actually, when I stood in front of it um, today, it was bigger than I remembered it being. <laughs> 
Oh, no, it was very strange. I, I guess I had shrank it in my mind as time went on, but I, I would ponder it, and it has that sense of fantasy or invention going on, and, and it's like what's not to like for you know a young person going St. George and the Dragon and its fairy tales, and the dragon has big bat wings, and so on and so forth, um, that I, I, I really responded to it on a variety of levels, from listening to somebody tell me a story to just catching the visuals of it and just the, 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 the action. St. George with his you know, spear going to slay the dragon while the maiden is, oh, thank you, you know, in the background there. So I, 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 I really like like the piece a lot and I continue to like it because sometimes you have things that you like early on that fade away in the distance. There's a lot going on in that painting, often a lot like your work, right? So now who picked the artichokes? <laughs> well, yes. Um, Whose remember. was this? Well, we all like it. Yeah. I, I, How could you not like this painting? I liked it because it looked like something I could do. <laughs> You know, I was not a skilled technician. Right. <laughs> but I liked the, the feeling of it. Well, I do think, again, this kind of surreal um, incorporation of a lot of disparate elements is something that um, all of you are working through in your work, and, and some of you continue to do, um, and not feeling necessarily obliged to resolve those relationships, that, in fact, you don't have to answer the questions. Um, and I think that's a painting that, that does that. I think I, cho I, think I chose this one. Um, hmm. Well, I, I think I like all the little scenarios and not so much that it's storytelling, but, but it, the, sort of the change in scale and um, the, the, the small figures um, juxtaposed with the big figure, um, and um, and sort of the, the way in which it, it was painted too, the sort of the sort of the looseness, not exactly looseness, but um, sort of the the way the images were made. They're they're kind of crude in a way, you know. They're not they're not elegant in in any sense of the word. Um, they're almost uh, they almost have a uh, almost a childlike quality to them, I think, that, that uh, appealed to me. Um, and uh, yeah, I, this is like when I was in school. And I, you know, uh, and um, maybe third year or something. I, I really, I liked Chagall and I liked this period uh, of Chagall. Um. Ooh. This, this painting scared the hell out of me when I was in school. I don't think I, when I came to school, I was prepared to see anything like the surface and the craft and the tiny little strokes and things of, of Ivan Albright. And I would stand in front of this painting a lot over the course of the four years that, that I was here. And it, first off, it's just a big black door. But then the more you look at it, the more there's there. And of course, you read everything in it. And then, of course, the title is That Which I Should Have Done, I Did Not Do, which is even scarier than looking at it. Um, I, I don't know what I would have done if um, Dorian Gray had been up at the same time. Because that painting, I mean, I, I, on a regular basis, I'm down here once a week, but on a regular basis, I will go into that gallery and look at both paintings. And I always have the impression in my mind, for instance, with Dorian Gray, that there is no color there. It's just this big black painting, except there's so much color in there, it's overwhelming to me. And the, the involvement, the darkness, and I mean visual darkness, but the psychological darkness that's involved there is, is just, it's scary. And in its scariness, it's wonderful. Okay, let's see how many, okay, we're gonna go 
to this last one, and then um, we're going to, I have one question for them, and then we're going to open it up to you also to prepare your questions. So. Yeah, that's. Oh. Well, we, I chose that too. <laughs> <laughs> he hasn't said anything yet too well, and let him talk. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I... <laughs> no, I just feel honored that you chose it. No, I want to hear why you chose it. I can't. <laughs> I'm, I'm having trouble. Well, this was something that, that growing up, um, and coming to the museum because I um, literally spent every Saturday in Fullerton Hall from the time I was eight years old through high school. And that also meant that I also was in the galleries looking at works of art. So I was here uh, attending a class and became familiar with his painting through slides that were shown uh, on the screen here and then went up to see it and just just so magnificent and awe-inspiring and amazing and gorgeous and not only gorgeous, just amazing. Why did you choose it, Jim? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I uh, was immediately, I mean, it's an enormous painting and very imposing. Uh, so I'm, I'm sort of awestruck in part by that. But the more I looked at it and the different things that I started seeing in, in the painting, uh, I, you know, the, the form uh, of the Madonna is such a three-dimensional, strong form, and yet the, the space below her that she's, you know, risen from uh, is very two-dimensional to me and weak and, and sort of tentative. And then these massive groups of figures on either side of the, of the sarcophagus. Uh, there's a floating head, seeming floating head uh, on the left side uh, over the um, uh, golden gold shirt. In any case, it's uh, maybe related to what you were talking about in terms of the importance of line. You can start find all, following all kinds of lines and you know where they sort of disappear and reappear, and it's uh, you know, compositionally, it's just a it's a wonderful painting to just run your eyes over. Okay, my last question to you all is: so, um, for an artist or a group of artists to have the chance, forty or fifty years later, to see the work that you've made, um, you haven't seen some of these kids in a long time. And I wondered, and you, that, you know, obviously you remember a lot about the exhibitions, but I was kind of curious to know that there's a substantial body of your work and your work together. Were there any things about in the exhibition that surprised you that you didn't recall or that you found really um, impressive to yourselves or shocking to yourselves after all these years? I, I think what impressed me is, I mean, you say, you know, we haven't seen them. I, I feel like I have, I, I'm, I, I was not unfamiliar. I was familiar with, with the work, but what I hadn't seen was it all together, the way it is in the show. And that, for me, I, I was like really struck at how wonderful the work looked together. Yeah, I, 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 I haven't seen, I mean, you get an idea in your head about what was in the show, and you see images and so on, but yeah, I agree with Sue Ellen, to see it together, and to, you know, look at how your own work developed. Uh, sometimes you're not aware of, of it, and sometimes you think, well, I've gone backwards, and so on and so forth. The, the further it gets away from me, it generally, I like it more. Uh, so it was, it was great. I'm glad, I, I'm glad I'm here to enjoy it. Uh, I, I talked about, you know, an artist's career. You climb the stairs like a child's slide. You get up at the top, and you look around and admire the view. And then gradually, you're, you're going to come back down to earth sooner or later. 
and a cheaply built slide will just plow you straight into the ground and those first. But we're, we've got these little bumps, and then at the end, the little things, you fly off in a, in a sort of aerodynamic fashion. <laughs> well, when, when I walked through and looked at everything, uh, I was very impressed. We were very young, and we were very accomplished, it turns out, back there. And uh, we, we did um, some pretty, pretty amazing work that I think in walking through the exhibition, and I've been through it a few times, continues to really hold my interest and just, it's amazing. I mean, I look at some of the drawings and the watercolors that I did, and I think, did I actually do that? That's pretty good. <laughs> I mean, it, it, <laughs> that's my feeling. <laughs> Um, you were like bodacious. You guys are just like on fire. It was, it's very impressive to, to think of how young you were and how much you did and that you worked together to accomplish that. It really is a wonderful um, standard. It's very inspiring. All right, I think we're opening up for questions and there's mics. Um, yes, we've got a couple of mics circulating on either side. Raise your hand and we'll come to you. Please make sure to speak into the mics so that everybody can hear. We'll start right over here. Hi. Um, this question is primarily for the gals up there, um, but, you know, anybody can pitch in. Um, but I think it's really interesting in the 60s as women, as artists, that, you know, you joined with a group and called yourself the Harry Who and had this identity within an identity that might help your art because you weren't identified solely as women. And I didn't know if that was part of the impetus of this as, as a collective or how that played out as Chicago, Chicago being one of the best cities for women in art. And I just would like some words to that. Thank you. Well, I, I, don't, I don't remember as a student or as a young artist during the time of the Harry Who feeling that there was a problem with being a woman and being an artist. Now that may sound very naive, but I, uh, for me, I, I just felt uh, an equal. I never felt any discrimination in school, and certainly when we were showing work together, um, you know, we were all equals. Um, so um, I think I was very fortunate in that way because I know that that throughout history and, you know, and uh, at that time and still, there, there, there is discrimination against, uh, well, maybe discrimination isn't the right word, but women have um, a difficult time getting equal uh, attention. But um, I don't know, Gladys, what do you think? I've forgotten the question already. <laughs> My mind is wandering through the El Greco, I'm sorry. I, I have nothing to add. It was about being a woman artist, that what, being part of a group? Well, Harry has to do with hair, right? It's not H-A-R-R-Y, it's H-A-I-R-Y. Oh. Uh -huh. we, we had a lot of uh, very powerful and important female teachers, and uh, they had a big effect on, on everybody, I think. Why don't we open up to another question? Do we have right. another one up there? We've got one there? up here on the right. Catherine Blackshear. Up on the right. Do we've got, oh, John, over there. Uh, so, Two things real quick. Uh, Jim, you came and spoke at my college in 1989 when I was a senior, and a uh, small college in Colorado, Colorado College, and you gave a retrospective basically of the Chicago art scene, and it was the first time I'd ever seen Chicago art, and it was a huge, huge influence on me, so, so thanks for coming to a small town. Uh, <laughs> second, um, the show it does a great service to how holistic the Harry Who, the early Harry Who exhibits were. 
And I was shocked and amazed that when you went to San Francisco, they didn't let you do any of that. Um, what did that feel like walking into San Francisco and people saying no? Unfortunately, I'm having a great deal of difficulty understanding. I mean, you know, there's something about the reverberation in the room. I'm just having real problems. I don't have a clue what you asked. Okay, I mean, I think the reason that we didn't, uh, if I understand the, correct, the question correctly, uh, the difference between the installation in San Francisco and what we did in uh, uh, the Hyde Park Art Center had more to do with logistics. Uh, we would have had to have been there for a greater length of time than we possibly could. Uh, there's a, we'd never, we didn't know the person that had invited us, and he maybe didn't necessarily trust us. He hadn't seen any of the shows. All he had seen were reproductions of the work, and he just wanted to exhibit the stuff. So there might have been a very practical reason on his part. Uh, and then there were really only uh, uh, Carl and Laurie and Gladys and I were the only two that made it. So it was an enormous show, and it would have been... Uh, it would have been impossible for us to do it. On the other hand, he did, one, one of the things that was uh, special about it, the, ex the exhibition area at the San Francisco, the school of, the San Francisco Art Institute, which is a school, was there, uh, they had a, a very large sort of vaulted ceiling, and at one end, Diego Rivera had painted this mural, uh, and in the mural is the, the rear end of Diego Rivera on the scaffolding, and when, when they unwrapped Art's paintings, one of his <laughs> large, you know, vertical figure paintings, he said, oh my God, you've got to see this, because they had a big curtain that would hang across the, the mural. We had no idea that it was up there, and it was, it was hysterical, though. The, 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 you know, the relationship between the there. two, yeah. And uh, in any case, it was a very, it was a, it was, a very nice installation, but it wasn't our installation. And there were, as I said, I think it was really more uh, the logistics in the situation. We have time for just one more question. One more question. Right over there, John, can you grab them? Thank you. Um, hi. Uh, it's nice to see you all together after 50 years. I have a question about the uh, similarity of the early work and how you, you, you separate more as the years go, of course. But in the beginning, there's a strong similarity between all your, you know, you're all young coming out of school. And I'm wondering if you, if you visited each other in your studios a lot, if you were talking a lot, or if it was more coincidental. I, we, we talked very infrequently. Quite frankly, I mean, there was not, we never, I mean, we lived in different areas of town. And so there wasn't, if we all lived in the same neighborhood, I think we would have seen a great deal of one another. But because we were living geographically, you know, split apart, um, for a while, we, none of us had cars, et cetera. Uh, there wasn't that. I, I was going to say that I don't ever recall our having conversations where we did talk about each other's work. We might talk about an exhibition that we'd seen, we might talk about a movie, or blah, 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 but I don't ever recall talking about each other's work at all. Yeah. And or I think that surprises a great deal of people that we did not sit around and speak sagely into the night about what was going on. <laughs> I, I, remember, I remember, Gladys and Jim, I remember visiting your, your place and seeing your work. I don't think we s talked about the work, but I certainly remember being excited and inspired by seeing the work. And I, I think what you were saying about living in different parts of the city, I think we probably lived maybe closer to each other. I don't remember visiting art studio or, or 
or, uh, or Carl or, uh, or Jim's studio, but I do remember seeing your work. It, we, we saw a lot of each other at openings of, of shows that we both had, all happened to be in or something. Uh, but being as part of that group, uh, you know, I, we didn't talk about work, but in my case, I was driven to do something by, because of seeing their work. You know, the, the good thing about a show, one of it, is you have a deadline, and I needed a deadline. And I'd see their work and think, I better get to work. And uh, <laughs> it was, it was a, you know, it was a... Uh, it, it, it raised your heart rate and got you going. I, I think, you know, where a lot of the collaboration came was in planning the shows, in, in doing the, uh, the posters collaboratively, in doing the comic books, in installing the show collaboratively. So I think that's where the, you know, the collaboration and the synergy happened as a group, mostly. Okay. So, so um, since we got a slightly late start, I'm going to abdicate my conclusion, and so we can have at least one more question. Uh, let's go down front. What did Harry Burroughs have to do with all this? <laughs> <laughs> Not much. <laughs> <clears throat> well. You during, during the first meeting, most, a lot of us didn't know Carl all that well. And he, he had been suggested by Don Baum that he should be part of this group that uh, had been put together. And we were discussing a radio program on WFMT, and he had an hour-long uh, program at that time uh, about art criticism. And he, he was, it sounded to me like he had started to cry while he was talking about a particular show. And being a callow youth, I thought that was funny. And we were joking about Harry. And uh, uh, just then Carl came in and he said, who is this Harry who? And we thought, and in order to protect us from a lawsuit from Harry Boris, we changed it H-A-I-R-Y. But then I started worrying that people would think we were a wannabe rock band of some sort. But <laughs> it didn't happen. I'll add on, on that thought that when the four of us, Jim, Carl, Laurie, and I were out in San Francisco, the uh, director of the gallery at the uh, you know, school there had called upon um, one of the school's patrons, uh, put us up in their uh, beautiful apartment. And they had a teenage daughter that was really excited because she thought that the who was coming to stay. <laughs> and she, of course, thought Lori and I were groupies. And uh, then she learned that it wasn't the who, it was the Harry who. She just was totally disinterested and disappeared for the entire time. <laughs> so on that note, could we get you guys to do a revival tour? Uh, <laughs> thank you all for coming.